Welcome back everyone. In this video, I am going to be responding to Hamza and John Fontaine's critique of my argument that the Injil and the Torah that they had at the time of Muhammad is the same as we have today. Some of you might know that I went on GodLogic's channel about a week, week or so ago. He brought me on to discuss the Injil in particular, about why the Injil that we have today is the same Injil that Muhammad was referring to back in his time, when he said it was both authoritative, inspired, and preserved. I gave a one hour PowerPoint to explain this. John Fontaine jumped on the live stream, attempted to give some response, but then left when Sam Shamoon came on. I'll let you figure out the reasons why. And in response, a few days later, Hamza and John Fontaine got together on a live stream and they did a response to my presentation, which is great. That's exactly what I want. I love criticism and hearing about stuff so I can evaluate it and learn things for myself. Unfortunately, most of their video was about Sam. <laughs> most of the video actually didn't really touch much on what I was saying, but they did touch a bit. So let's go through it and see what they had to say. Let's go. So this particular stream, is uh, been designed specifically to deal with the Christian questioning the idea of the Injil. Now, for a long time now, and even Muslims have made this mistake, uh, believing the New Testament was the Injil, but it was corrupted and da, 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 da. Okay, so what we're here to demonstrate is that the Injil is a separate text to the new testament whether it's text whether it was oral is will be decided or be determined um the christians try to make the claim that it doesn't exist um and that what they had in medina in the time of the prophet Salam was the same bible as that they hold in their hands today and therefore to trust in the gospel is what to trust into what they uh they hold today okay let's pause right there First of all, I'm very careful with the words that I use during this presentation. I am not saying the Injil is synonymous with the New Testament. I'm not saying from the Injil or the Torah, I can extrapolate that to the Bible. In fact, I intentionally never use the term Bible in my presentation at all. That is a question for a later day. I want to go back to basics and I want to figure out what the term Injil meant and what the term Torah meant whether Muhammad would have been referring to the one in his time that he would have been familiar with, and what would that have been? Would that have been the same as ours today, or would it have been a different one? That's the question I am particularly answering here. It's also interesting that Hamza talks about how too many Muslims have equated the Injil with the New Testament and then made the argument that it's corrupted. I think Hamza and others are starting to realize that the corrupted argument actually backfires quite significantly, and I think they're trying to change to a hypothetical Injil instead of a corrupted Injil. After all, it's kind of embarrassing that Muhammad would have confirmed a corrupted Injil, right? Why would your prophet confirm a corrupted book without telling you <laughs> that the book is corrupted? And then he would hold you accountable to the corrupted book. Seems kind of unfair and, well, seems weird. Let's put it that way. And Chris made a very, very, if you know Chris from Speaker's Corner. That's me. Hello, Hamza. He made a, an hour long, um, we'll say, argument to say that the Bible they have today is the same as what existed in the time of the prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, and there was no different one. Um, I, I have, I've got a feeling they've been watching me, Hamza, because they keep calling me either your dad or your teacher. Super quick thing here. The reason I said that, and I think God Logic said that was because John Fontaine went on God Logic's channel a few months ago during Ramadan and he introduced himself as Hamza's dad. <laughs> so it kind of stuck. We've been speaking offline a lot and we've spent time together actually personally as well. And I know, you know, we've been speaking about this concept and you seem to have adopted the same ideas as what I have as well. You yeah. kind of you understood it that way anyway. It's not I didn't bring something new. I, I don't I don't I don't like to use the argument Muhammad in the Bible based upon what the Bible today says as if it's some kind of corrupted yeah. original source type thing. Yeah, I mean you know you you, you know your understanding it's it's a it's a substituted book. You know this is yeah. a, a book. Yeah, exactly. That's Bible, the best. You know? Yeah, and um, and that's my understanding. So notice they're pivoting gradually from arguing the the Bible can be used as a reference text to demonstrate Muhammad's prophethood, which just keep in mind is the gold standard and has been for many, many decades of how you argue Muhammad's prophethood. Because again, this is mentioned in the Quran that they can find him mentioned in the previous scriptures, which would be the Injil and the Torah at the very least. So much so that Dr. Michael Brown and Hussein had a debate literally just last year, and it was filmed by Sokra Films about this very topic. And Hussein made the case that in the Torah, 
And in the Injil, you can find Muhammad mentioned. And by Torah and Injil, he means the Injil and the Gospels we have today. But they're trying to get away from this now. Now it's just becoming a substitution theory, so to speak. The idea that it's not the Injil that they had at the time. It was some sort of super secret hidden Injil that only a certain sect or a certain group of people had that Muhammad had access to. And that was the one he was referring to. My presentation was aimed at showing why that's incredibly improbable. And the more probable aspect is that he was referring to the Injil and Torah that they had at the time that everyone knew, basically. The funny thing is, when we looked at Chris's argument, his line of thinking was a lot higher level, if you like. It was a lot more academic than Sam. And and um, but but Sam, I don't know if he knows or not, but he just totally refuted Chris <laughs> within five minutes, like just totally. And, and I don't I don't think they realized it. I didn't realize it at the time because they threw me out, and I was I wasn't really watching, you know the um, the what they said after I left. When I went back and looked, I'm thinking, subhanAllah, Sam's indirectly refuted Chris. And when I looked at Chris's presentation, he's also indirectly, there's something in his presentation that also refutes him as well. So, um, okay. yeah, we just wait okay. to get into it, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, I have, uh, I've watched this whole live stream. I have no idea how he comes to this conclusion. It seems to be something that I think the term Torah just refers to the five books, but Sam demonstrated the term Torah could also mean the Old Testament as well. Therefore, I'm refuted. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, you can extend the Torah to the Old Testament, sure, but I would just expand my argument to be, well, the Torah refers to the Old Testament they had at the time then. It, it actually doesn't really change anything. So strange he thinks that. But anyway, let's continue. So he makes, a, he makes a whole argument that um, he's trying to prove that when Islam speaks about the Torah and the Injil and also the Zabor. I never mentioned the Zabor in my entire presentation. But okay, there's a recurring theme that they keep thinking I'm arguing for more than I'm arguing. I hope that's not intentional. I'm making this very plain and simple. I'm talking about just two things, the Torah and the Injil. Whether the Torah is the first five books or whether it is the entire Old Testament, that's fine. Doesn't really change my argument. But for now, it's just the Torah and the Injil. And that he's speaking about the Bible. And his proof for that is basically um, because the because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. What I don't understand here is, why are you skipping through my slides? Like, just a weird ad hoc way of doing it. Why not just start at the first slide and go through each one instead of just flashing each slide on the screen for a few seconds and then... Moving on. No one's going to learn anything that way. You mentioned that I talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, that was one of the things I mentioned. But I mentioned other manuscripts in one dedicated slide that you could have shown and showed people, look, he's claiming all these manuscripts. They say you just skip past it. Um, because it, we can prove that the, the Old Testament has not changed. It's not just before the Prophet, peace be upon him, but also before Isa, this is his claim. And also, because the majority of people at the time, he has this map, uh, at the time of the Prophet There was a bunch of Christians. Were Trinitarians, uh, Bible following Trinitarians. Okay, so what this presentation. is it. Yeah, I mean, look at it, it's beautiful, man. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I was gonna take some of these slides for my own. Uh, yeah, we're classes in comparison, we're gonna carry on. Do find it slightly odd they really like my presentation but okay again these are common things that people do when they want to change the argument because they don't like how it currently stands i never said i can prove definitively anything and i don't like those kind of terms being used because it's just not how the real world works i can give you good evidence for a lot of things and you should probably follow that good evidence especially if you believe that it shows that something is more probable than not that's how you base your decisions in life no one bases the decisions they make in life on absolute 100% definitive proof. No one does that. Like, like seriously, think. Your daily routine, is it based on 100% proof or is it based on the things that you know and the things that are probable? There's overwhelming evidence that the most probable outcome here is that Muhammad accidentally affirmed an injil that he didn't quite understand. There's overwhelming evidence that Muhammad, at his time, had access to the injil as we have it today and confirmed it affirmed its reliability, its inspiration, its preservation, told people they were accountable to it, 
without realizing what the contents of the Injil actually were, because he was illiterate or because he didn't believe people who told him what was actually written in it. That's my point. He's, he spent a whole hour proving, without a shadow of a doubt according to him, that when the Qur'an speaks about the Torah and Injil, it's speaking about the Bible. I never said Bible. <laughs> I never said Bible. There is no point in this entire presentation I did where I said Bible. I never said that. I don't need to mention the Bible for this argument to work. No one does. It might be the case that that's true, but I don't need to say it's true. I don't need to argue for it. All I need to do is take the understanding of the Injil, take the understanding of the Torah, and apply it in its historical context. That's all I need to do. I don't need to mention any of the books. I don't need to mention the Bible. I don't need to go into anything like that. So let's keep it simple, basic and simple. Number one, because the Bible predates Islam. So it didn't change after Islam. It was compiled before and it, and it, it predates Islam, which I agree with. And number two, because the majority, not I say majority, but not all of the Christians, but he admits this in his presentation. When, when I question him about it, uh, he says the majority of them were Trinitarian, Bible-following Trinitarians, which I also agree with. Uh, but, the, but the conclusion still doesn't stand. If I told someone to follow the Injil, in other words, act out the Injil, whatever the Injil commands you to do, you have a moral duty to do that. Then I ask that person what the Injil is, and they tell me, and they say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they say it's a foundational part of their scripture that has been canonized by their church. It is considered a part of their religion. What it means to be a Christian, you follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what is revealed therein about the Lord and Son of God, the word of God that was made flesh, that died for our sins to give atonement for all mankind, and then rose again three days later, conquering death. If you, you ask a guy and he says that, and then you ask another Christian, and he says the same thing, and you ask another one, and he says the same thing, and then you ask a hundred Christians, and they all say the same thing. Okay, from different areas, by the way. And then you find one guy who says, actually, I think the Injil is a book of magic spells written in 200 BC by Julius Caesar. Okay, now, common sense would dictate to you that immediately, the guy that said it was Julius Caesar who wrote the Injil is probably wrong, probably wrong. And he doesn't represent a mainstream understanding of what the Injil is. And this is kind of where this, their line of thinking falls apart, because it isn't sufficient enough for them to find a random sect or a random group of minority Christians, in the looser sense, who claim that the Injil is some weird book written by Julius Caesar, for example. But they have to claim that this was a well-established and comparatively respected view of what the Injil was in the world. So if you had something like 20%, 30% of the world's population, because again, the Quran is a revelation for mankind, believing that's what the Injil was, then maybe there'd be a case to make for that. But there's nothing like that. There is no substantial, significant version of the Injil that differs from what the Orthodox Oriental Church says, the Byzantine Church says, the Church of the East says, the Orthodox Church says. You just don't you just don't find this. And that's the problem for them. It becomes almost unthinkable to, to ignore the definition accepted by, I mean, let's say what it is. You're now talking about something that is intercontinental. So you have Africa thinking that the Injil is what we have today. You have Europe thinking the Injil is what we have today. You have the Middle East thinking the Injil is what we have today. And yet somehow this tiny group somewhere trumps all of that. Keep in mind, by the way, in, in the grand scheme of things, this tiny group dies out basically immediately because no one knows who they are, no one has an oral tradition that goes back to them, and no one preserves their scripture, which is the most suspicious thing in the world. I mean, think about that. They're claiming there is this alternative group in the Hejaz that has their own version of the Injil, that's the Muslim version of the Injil, so to speak, and that that's the one Muhammad's referring to, and that's the one that says Jesus was just a prophet, and Muhammad is mentioned. They believe that, and they believe that, oh, it accidentally went somewhere. Whoa, we had it right there, and then it disappeared. We lost it. Where did it go? Where did the Injil go? Oh no, that's really unfortunate. It's not as if we could have used that Injil to prove to the entire world that Muhammad was a prophet. I mean, seriously, they, they had proof in their hands that Muhammad was prophesized by referring to a scripture that prophesized him before he came and they lost it. Even though their area was not conquered or taken over by the Christians and the Hejaz, they still weren't able to preserve it. Yeah, they preserved the Quran fine, apparently. Apparently. Anyway, let's continue. The Greek which they're appealing to, uh, Evangelion, uh, has become to mean good news. Now, the problem is, Jesus did not speak Greek. Ah, uh, yes. We've finally come down to the basic Tao script. You can't get away from it too long, huh? Jesus didn't speak Greek. 
There are plenty of scholars that think he did, and there's plenty of reason to think he did. The narrative in the Gospels presupposes that he's able to have conversations with people who would have spoke Greek. The names of the disciples, like Philip and Andrew, have Greek origin names, demonstrating that that region at the time had been Hellenized, which we all know. There are tons of inscriptions on stone and on other materials that are written in Greek by Jews, demonstrating that Jews did have some knowledge of Greek. And last, just to demonstrate this, the Septuagint was written in Greek. Why? Why did the Jews translate their scriptures into Greek like 300 years before Jesus came? I mean, <laughs> this argument makes no sense. Like, it really doesn't. Now, I'm not saying Jesus was the best Greek person ever in the sense that he knew Greek to a level that was in his humanity better than a native Greek speaker. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he did have some knowledge of Greek. Also, in the Quran, Jesus' words are quoted in the Quran and Jesus' words are written in Arabic. Jesus didn't speak Arabic. Ah, but you see, Allah translated them and Allah is perfect so he can't get the translation wrong so it's perfectly preserved even though jesus didn't speak arabic oh okay so the gospels were inspired by the holy spirit and we believe the holy spirit is god therefore god inspired the scriptures and made sure that there was no errors in the translation okay thank you very much <laughs> this is why the argument is dumb because ultimately we could just go back to saying that we believe the same thing that you do basically because you also translate people's words into languages they didn't speak like from aramaic to arabic or from hebrew to arabic maybe from Greek to Arabic. Okay. And in different parts of the New, New, the New Testament, it says, obey the Evangelion. So here you have, you know, a concept, the Evangelion, something that Jesus had in his lifetime being spoken about, something that Jesus had himself, some his, something his disciples had called the Evangelion. Whereas we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were biographies that were authored later 50, 60, 100 years, 150 years after the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. 150 years? No. <laughs> Not sure where he gets roughly in a date of 183 AD for some of the Gospels. That seems a bit crazy. Like a general consensus, like roughly, because everyone has quite ranging dates on this. For the authorship of the Gospels, um, for the synoptics, it's usually around 70 AD. And for John's, it's more like 90 to 100. But that would mean that the earliest Gospels since Jesus died in roughly 33 AD, you're talking about 37 years, not 150 years. That's that's crazy. I don't know where you got that number from. And of course, the Pauline letters actually predate that, just for reference. They come even earlier, like 25 years or so. They're writing about the lifetime of Jesus. So how can the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the New Testament itself be the Evangelion when Jesus is saying he has something in his lifetime? So the point, the point I was merely saying here is the Islamic concept of Injil is not gospel because the the Judo Christian, I would say the Christian understanding of gospel makes you think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the New Testament, and that is not what is being spoken about in the Quran. But his main point here is effectively just to double down on something the Quran says and just hold it as gospel truth, no pun intended. If the Quran says that the gospel, the Injil, is understood to be something that is given to Jesus as a book they tend to assert, then it's impossible that the disciples wrote it as biographical accounts. So that must mean that we take that for truth and just hold it as truth for some reason. I mean, I don't see any reason to do that. I don't think you should just assume what the Quran says is true. I think that's very circular. And I also think that there's no evidence to support that that actually happened. It certainly wasn't the understanding of the early church. It wasn't the understanding of even heretical groups, as far as I'm aware. I don't know, it'd be interesting, actually. Can you show me a heretical group that says that Jesus received a book? I think there's a much more simpler and straightforward response to this idea that because the Quran says it was given to Jesus as a book, and the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that we have today are not that singular book that was given to Jesus, there's an easy response. Easy response to this. Muhammad didn't know what the Injil was. And I think that solves everything. That solves every issue, every mistake Muhammad makes about the Trinity, not understanding what the Trinity is in Surah Al Maida, Ayah 116, not understanding that Jesus was crucified in Surah An Nisa, Ayah 157, not understanding that the Christians and the Jews are considered children of God in uh, Surah Al Maida, Ayah 18. You see, that solves all of that because he just didn't know what was written in these scriptures because he himself couldn't read, so he couldn't validate it. And people who told him this and probably said, hey, this is in our scriptures, this is what we read, he probably thought, no, that can't be in there. No. You guys, you guys are making that up, right? You you put that in there, you're just saying it. It doesn't say that in your scriptures, you're just making it up. When in reality, no, it does say that in the scriptures. 
Muhammad was just ignorant of these facts, and because he was ignorant of these facts, he made errors when he told Christians and Jews to follow what is written in their scripture that they had with them at his time. Whoops. Again, big mistake. Or, of course, maybe the Quran is just de facto true without really giving any reasons why it's true. Maybe it just is because reasons. This bit's really weird. I don't know why he makes this argument. It's a really bad one, but we'll see what he says. All right, so you just reiterate the point you just made then, because you did say quite a lot. I just wanted to understand the point. The point I'm making, if you look at this ayah, all we're saying is confirms what came before it and he confirms what was revealed in the Torah and Injil. So here you have a separation of what's between their hands or what came before it and the Torah and Injil. There's two separate things being spoken about here. Okay. Can you see it? And he says, Mabaina Yadehi. He isn't referring to what they have in their hands right now, right? Um, I think you went through my presentation. I included other verses like Surah Abakla, Ayah 41, uh, Surah 7, Ayah 157, where it makes explicitly clear the scripture that's being referenced is what they have written with them. So yes, this is talking about what they have in Muhammad's time. And yes, this is addressing Christians. And yes, majority of Christendom are Trinitarian, Nicene Creed believing Christians who read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and refer to that as the Gospels. Or Gospel, meaning good news. The prophet in, in, in the ayah is saying he sent down the book in truth, which is the Quran, which confirms, or confirms what came before it and what was revealed in the Torah and Jeel. Okay. Now, this, this thing about what's between their hands or what came before it is talking about the truthfulness of what they have. Okay. For instance, in the New Testament today, there's things that are true, right? Saying Isa had, uh, uh, you know, miraculous birth. Uh, in the Old Testament, it speaks about Musa parting the sea. These things are true, okay? The, the Quran affirms the truthfulness of what's between their hands or what came before. Because the Bible, even though it's not from Moses or Jesus or Allah, it still came before, okay? But it also confirms the Torah and the Injil, the actual revelation that was sent down, subhanAllah. Okay. So so I just wanted to, to mention that. It's just a, more of a side point, really. I like how he walks the argument back, like, oh, it's just a side point. <laughs> you can't make an argument. Spend a good amount of time explaining it and then be like, yeah, just a side point, though. What? <laughs> it was a terrible side point. Maybe you realized as you were saying it, oh, wait, actually, this sounds kind of dumb. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk this back. <laughs> because in essence, John Fontaine just affirmed some form of partialism in that he's saying, well, yes, the Quran does talk about the Torah and the injury that they have with them, but unbeknownst to us, it's actually referring to just the things that are true and not the things that are false. But that means that you have a prophet, i.e. Muhammad, who came and confirmed a corrupted book. And he did so in wholesale ways, like Surah Maida Ayah 43, where he tells the Jews, I don't need to judge. You've got the Torah, right? It's all good. He didn't say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Actually, you have a corrupted Torah that's like a little bit right, but got a lot of wrong stuff in there, saying that you believe you're the children of God and that Yahweh is a father and don't like that. Never mentions this, which you would have thought would have been quite important for a prophet that's particularly interested in the idea of Tawheed and oneness of God and not associating partners with him. But apparently he let that slide. And then again, Surah Maida, just a few verses later, in verse 47, again, tells the people of the Injil to follow the Injil. Doesn't say only parts of it. He doesn't say just a little bit of it. He says that you actually need to. Keep in mind that Muslims also have to do this. Muslims also have to follow the Torah and the Injil as part of the six articles of Iman. If the book is corrupted and Muhammad has confirmed a corrupted book, then your religion is forever embedded in it. The instruction to follow and affirm the teachings inside a corrupted book. Yeah, I don't think you want to say that. Um, that that's, not a good, that's not a good look. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, moving on. And uh, um, but this is very, very important subtle points. Um, but as you'll see as they go on, uh, he, he kind of uh, gets on to refuting himself. You mean you mean today, you mean? No, at the time of Muhammad. At the time of Muhammad? Well, there were different Christians. We, I'll come to that later. Oh, sure. You know, there were definitely yeah, different Christians. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There were Christians you know. who were not part of the yeah. Imperial Church, the Oriental Church, the Orthodox Church, Roman yeah. Catholic Church, the Church of the East. But all of those churches I just listed are all Nicene Creed believing Trinitarian churches. So that encompasses 95, if I'm being generous, percent of the whole world. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. At the time of the Prophet, the majority of Christians at that point 
had unified on Trinitarian Nicene Creed, but they were not. They were not the. Only Just I wanted to correct myself there because Nicene Creed is not Trinitarian. It's not. It's not the full development. The full development of the Trinity. Nicene Creed was speaking about the the position of the Son uh, with the Father. The, the the final stage of the development of the, of the Trinity came after that as well. So I just mm. needed to correct myself there. What? <laughs> okay, I don't think you guys are understanding this point. Unless you're just being pedantic, you need a group of Christians with their own scripture, their own in jail, in somewhere in the world that affirms Muslim beliefs. You need this because your Quran affirms it, right? And it says it at the time of Muhammad and what they had written with them. So this is at the time of Muhammad. You can't go back in the past. You have to do it at his time. Good luck finding that because it doesn't exist. Now his point here was to say, well, hang on, they were, Nicene Creed believing doesn't mean Trinitarian. Well, at that time it would have, yes. I would make the argument that 325, even at that point, in the first version of the Creed, they would have believed that the Holy Spirit is also consubstantial with the Father. In fact, I don't think that was really in question. That's why there's no explicit statement there. But of course, they did actually add the explicit statement a few decades later. So let's read that. I mean, remember, this is just at the end of the 4th century. That's at the very least 200 years before Muhammad. So let's see what these churches were believing that represent, as I said, roughly 95%. Basically just the overwhelming majority of Christians in the world. Let's see what it says. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty. So first of all, immediately that's not reconcilable with Islam. God is a father according to this. So immediately anyone who believes this cannot be a Muslim. But let's keep reading. Maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, to call Jesus Lord implies that you equate him with God. So that's problematic. The only begotten son of God. And of course he's the unique, the monogamous son of God. Again, your Quran says that God has no sons in any sense. So that's incompatible. Begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, a very God of very God. Very God of very God. Just so you know, by the way, we recite this every Sunday. <laughs> this is the creed we recite in churches every Sunday, which they back then would have been reciting every Sunday. Begotten, not made. Not made. Wow. Jesus wasn't created. Interesting. Consubstantial with the Father. So of the same nature, the same essence as the Father. So yes, he is God. By whom all things were made. Oh, interesting. Jesus and the Father made all things. Okay. Whom for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. Again, that refutes the Quran. Not compatible because the Quran in Surah Nisa, Ayah 157, makes it clear that Jesus was not crucified and suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. Again, the Quran denies this and ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. And thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead. Jesus will judge. Interesting. Whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. The Holy Spirit is worshipped along with the Father and the Son because they are God. I'll finish this off. In one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and of the life of the world to come. Amen. There is nothing in that in even in the earlier version as well that is compatible with Islam. So whether you take the earlier version or the, the later version, doesn't matter. It does not work with Islam. You cannot point to anyone who believes this, but the problem is, is this was already agreed upon centuries before Muhammad. So where do you go from here? Well, you have to look for really weird heretical sects that are tiny, that supposedly have scripture that affirms the Islamic belief. But you're not going to find it because there is nothing like that. And this is why we know Islam is false. Only sect, as you know. They were, they Absolutely, were, they were not yeah. the only sect. But if yeah. the majority I, I, is I totally one agree. sect... I... So here, I feel like he was trying to pull the wall. You know, he's saying that, you know, all these surrounding empires of, of Arabia were Trinitarian. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to understand what, what what the point of voice. So he's basically so he's established with all yeah. his beautiful map and this, that, the yeah. other, and all his, you know, explanation, Oriental Church and this, that, the other. They were yeah. all Trinitarian believing Christians. Fine. OK, so yeah. because they're Trinitarian Christians around Arabia, What's the point he's making with this? So he's evidenced that they're Trinitarian Christians. Yes. Yeah, so what what's that to demonstrate? Beautiful question, Hamza. I'm so glad you asked it. I would have preferred it if you asked me it in person. But since that seems unlikely to happen, I'll answer it now. The reason it's problematic is that Muhammad was actually kind of quite multicultural in a sense. He wasn't just confined to the Hijaz and just stayed there. According to your traditions, he was a trader. 
mostly because his wife Khadija was a trader and he was brought in to aid and assist with her business, he would have went to many places in the world. And there are traditions that say he went to Syria. There are traditions that say that he engaged with people from Najran, which is a place in Yemen. And he would have engaged with Christians there. That's what, as the story goes. He had friends and family and his own wives that went to Ethiopia and they saw churches there, as I pointed out in the presentation. And they went back and they told Muhammad about it. Muhammad, if you believe he went to Israel, to the Temple Mount, he went to Israel where there would have been Christians there. Trinitarian, Nicene Creed believing Christians. He wrote to heads of states, particularly Christian states, like Alexandria and Egypt, which was the patriarch of the Orthodox Oriental Church. He wrote to Heraclius, the emperor of Constantinople, who again, Trinitarian. What I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that Muhammad actually had more engagement with Trinitarians than any other kind of Christian group. That's another fact that you can't really call someone Christian at this point if they deny the Trinity, both today and at this point in time. But Muhammad had knowledge of these things. He would have known what these people claimed to believe. And he demonstrates it because he argues against it. In Surah 4, Ayah 171, he says, look, don't say three, desist. Stop saying three. And it's in reference to the people of the book. So he knows these things. But he hasn't figured out, or at least doesn't believe they're actually in their scripture, even though he would have had people saying to him, yes, this is in our scripture. This is what we believe. This is what's been revealed to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is no recorded tradition where Muhammad meets people who are not Trinitarian Christians. There just isn't one. I challenge you to bring me a tradition that is authentic, that Muhammad went to a non-Trinitarian, non-Nicene Creed affirming group of Christians, supposedly, who have their own scripture. I challenge you to do that. You can't do it because they didn't exist and there's no evidence of such. And that which has no evidence can be dismissed without evidence. But in this case, actually, all the evidence says that, yeah, Muhammad was referring to the Injil the Trinitarians have because he hung around with Trinitarians. <laughs> That's the problem. He's chilling with Trinitarians. And so when he's writing or revealing this Quran, it would be ignorant of him if he doesn't distinguish between the fake Injil and the real one. And he never does. Which means to me... In order to in order, in order to take the evidence into account and to not just call him an ignorant person, I would have to say that, yes, he's referring to the injil that the Trinitarian Christians have, that he met with and that he spoke with and that he knew about. That, no, but that, I, I think I understand what he was saying. Okay, go on. So what he's basically trying to say is because all of the Christians around uh, the, the Arabia were Trinitarian believing Christians, believing the... Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, that when the Quran was revealed in Arabia, and it was it was revealed to the whole world, when the the majority of Christians who would have heard the ayat with regards to the Injil, would have assumed it's referring to the Gospels because that's what they believe the Gospels to be, the Injil to be. So I I think that's the the link he's trying to make, personally. Well done, Hamza. You correctly understood the claim that I'm making. It's Beautiful, I love it. Keep in mind that all the evidence I've presented points in that direction. Muhammad was familiar with Trinitarians. He hung out with Trinitarians. He had companions and family who also hung out with Trinitarians in different areas of the world, according to your traditions. Therefore, it's reasonable to assume that when he talks about the scripture of the people of the book, and that refers to Christians, he's referring to Trinitarians. If he isn't, you need to give me proof from the Quran or the Sunnah that demonstrates it's not the Torah or the angel that they hold with them, despite the fact that that's what the Quran says. You can't do this. All you can do is point to claims where Muhammad seems to think the Torah is something else or seems to think the Injil is something else. All you can do is you can point at claims where Muhammad tries to describe the Injil that they have with them or the Torah they have with them and uses and ascribes to those things words that aren't actually in there today. The problem is, Hamza and John Fontaine, I think the best explanation is that he's just ignorant of it. He doesn't know what these things are. He isn't able to articulate them because he is illiterate and hasn't read the Injil of the Torah and is relying on hearsay. And again, remember, this is an oral culture. The Hijaz is not a literate area. Pretty much all scholars agree on this, including Islamic scholars. So if it's an oral area, Muhammad is already hearing things. He's just hearing, you know, some Christians talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even that, he manages to get wrong in the Quran in Surah 5, Ayah 116. But anyway, he just hears things and it's up to him to try to figure out what's the correct understanding, what's the wrong understanding. All he thinks, though, is that whatever is in the Injil they have 
has been preserved. There's no question about that. He thinks that whatever they have in the Torah has been preserved. There's no question of that. The traditions and the Quran make that exceptionally clear. He has no argument with what they have with them at his time. He only has issue with those who are corrupting the text, again, the text they have with them, by making copies themselves or by changing it orally. But he still affirms in order for them to be doing that, they have the text with them, which he says is inspired, preserved, and authoritative. I, I, I don't understand why Trinitarian um, matters at this point. Well, it doesn't really. It, 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 the, point, the point that's being made is that those Christians who believed in the Bible, Gospels, believed in the Gospels, was the yeah. Egypt. When they, when, they, when they would have heard the Quran speaking about the Gospels, they would have assumed it's referring to what they believe to be the Gospels. Do you get me? Yeah. Although it would make no sense when <laughs> when it says it was given to given well, to that's Jesus. the point. The, 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 the that, that's where beginning. that's where if I was a Christian, if I was a, I was just thinking, wrong. if I'm a Christian at the time, thinking, okay, what's this Quran saying? Uh, and then I hear it saying it's saying about a book given to Jesus. And like, well, wait a minute, this is not this. Is well, not that's the right. point. It doesn't matter what they think. What yeah. they think when they hear the Injil, the Quran's correcting it. You got to think when they hear in jail, the Quran is correcting it. That's what John Fontaine said there. Remember, that's called a circular argument. He's basically just saying we need to take the Quran as being correct in this matter because otherwise Islam is false. So it has to be this way. There's no potential alternative. And this is ultimately all he has. He can't bring any evidence of this. He means so far in the presentation, there has been no evidence of his, 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 of his case. He doesn't have any. All he has is this idea that the Quran is true. Therefore, if the Quran says that the Injil is a book that was given down to Isa, that must be true. Even if every, like, all of the known world disagrees with that. And even if Muhammad tells them to follow their Injil. And keep in mind, it is their Injil because he says it to them as an instruction. He says, oh, people of the book, you stand on nothing unless you follow the Injil. Oh, people of the book, judge by the Injil. And notice as well, at no point in this has he addressed one of the main points I make in the presentation. There's an accountability issue. Because in verses like Surah al Maida, Ayah 68, he tells the people of the Injil that they have to follow and judge by the Injil. That's not possible. Think about this. Again, let's go with 95% of the Christian world. They have their own NGO, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In a very small part of the world where Muhammad lives, apparently, even though Muhammad actually had lots of connections with lots of parts of the world, we'll just say the Hijaz, there's a group of Christians who are non-Trinitarian, non-Nicene Creed-believing Christians who have their own scriptures, right? They have their own NGO that affirms everything uh, that the crowd says it does. Allah is therefore telling all the Christians in the world, you have to follow what's in that NGO. That's very specific NGO. Not the one you have that the rest of the world has, this very specific Injil in a place that, for all intents and purposes, it's called Petraea Deserta. It literally means just nothing but desert. You need to go to that place, find that Injil, and follow what is written in that Injil, because you are accountable to it. Okay? But basically, no one could do that. Oh, and also, uh, that Injil will be destroyed very shortly after Muhammad's death. And there will be no oral tradition, and no written tradition explaining what it is. And there's no oral tradition that survives telling you what it is. And there's no written tradition that survives telling you what it is. So good luck with that. How are these Christians supposed to follow the Quran? They can't. That's the problem. In fact, you can actually trace this back because although this is revealed in the Quran, this, this command, you would have assumed that the previous, that, that command wouldn't just all of a sudden become binding then when Muhammad revealed it, but rather it would have always been binding on the Christians from the time of Isa. So now you have roughly 600 years where, although there are now presumably millions of Christians in the world, only about a hundred of them, let's say, have actually followed the Injil. All of the others, even though they had nothing to do with it, they it's not in their control. They weren't born in the Hejaz. They don't have access to the super duper secret Injil that's the original one Allah sent. They don't have access to it. All they have is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they're being held accountable for it. The Quran says very clearly they are to judge by what they have in the Injil. So the Quran basically gives impossible commands that no one can actually enact, and only for a very short period of time. And yet they're going to be judged according to it. That's an accountability issue. The Quran holds people accountable to something they actually can't be held accountable to. They don't have any choice. They don't have access to it. The Quran is meant to be for all mankind, and yet it's not applicable to the vast majority of the world's population. That's an issue. And for that reason, the Quran cannot be talking about a unique supplementary Muslim in jail because it results in nonsense claims about accountability. The same thing also applies to the Torah. So you have a double fold. So you'll have to say there's a super secret in jail and there's also a super secret Torah, which would also have to be separate books as well.
So you now have to have this grand conspiracy theory for not just one group in their book, but for also another group in their book. And it gets, starts getting out of hand in terms of how impractical this is and improbable this is and how nonsensical this is. No, but even, even uh, if you don't believe in Islam, there could still be an alternative uh, in uh, gospel or, or, or the, the ones in, in Medina could be mistaken because historically there are other heretical, if you like, yeah, exactly. Christian sects with different books. Yeah. But he, so, so even from a historical perspective, it's not, it, you know, it, it, it could be a, her, a, a different heretical group. You yeah, know, yeah, it, I, yeah. it could be a different group. It could be a different heretical group, says John Fontaine. Right. Give me evidence for that. My claim is you can't give me evidence for that because there is no evidence for that. There is nothing that would let you come to that conclusion. It's pure blind faith and just asserting the Quran as true because you can't do otherwise. He needs to give us evidence. So far he's given us no evidence. So we should dismiss it without evidence. Though again, we have all the evidence, but you know you know what I mean. It's a, it's a quote. You know, you know what's interesting? In in the Panarian, I mentioned this, this the Bishop Epiphanius of Salamis, he's, he's wrote a book about it. It's about 200 CE, right? So about 180 years after Jesus approximately, right? Mm. And he lists a group of Jewish Christians in there called Nazarenes, right? And he says that this group did not believe in the Old Testament or the New Testament. They, they had an alternative scripture, you know, and, and they didn't believe Jesus was God or the Son of God either. So, and he's, he's saying they're heretical. The point is, even historically, there was... Uh, you know, a, a sect which which Islam speaks about. You know, Islam's claiming there was a sect what believed Jesus was a man. You know, and uh, I'm not saying the Nazarenes are the saved sect, are the, are the Muslim sect. I'm just merely showing that historically that there are many different sects with different beliefs. And this one is, happens to be more in line. And it's interesting how the Quran also refers to them as the Nasara, the Nasara. There's a group called the Nazarenes, says John Fontaine, that didn't believe Jesus is God, they had their own scripture, and they didn't think he was the son of God. Interesting. Okay, well, I got this paper here. In 377 AD, F. Fenentius of Salamisus wrote the Panarion. In the Panarion, he labelled 80 religious sects as heretics. Among those groups was a Jewish Christian sect called the Nazarenes. The Nazarenes believed that there is one God, that Jesus was the son of God, oh dear, and the Messiah, that there will be a resurrection of the dead and that both the Old and New Testaments were to be used as scripture. For Ephenatius, the only fault of this sect was in their continued observance of the law of Moses. Oh dear, oh dear. You know, if you're going to give me an example of like a heretical group that supposedly doesn't believe in Christian doctrine and believes in something that matches with the Quran, because again, that's what you need to do, at least make sure you're naming a correct group. Like Muslims do this all the time. They say like the Ebionites, and it's like, yeah, but the Ebionites... <laughs> The Ebionites denied the virgin birth, so uh -uh, that can't be the true Islamic group of Christians either. They'll go through every group they possibly can to try to find one that aligns with Islam, but not a single one does because there's always some pivotal primary doctrine they disagree with. Once again, no evidence. Christian, all the evidence. Islam, none of the evidence, to briefly summarize. And ladies and gentlemen, I will end with this clip. I think this kind of summarizes it all, really. That's it. We've not even presented our evidences yet. We have so much more to speak about. We don't need to go there today. So John Fontaine says, look, we haven't even presented our case. And it's like, well, <laughs> it would have been good if you did because everything you came up with in this live stream that you covered that was relevant to my presentation really didn't do anything. You weren't, you agreed with me that the historical context that Muhammad was living in was a Trinitarian, Nicene Creed believing context. You agreed with me that the Al Al Qatar people of the book can refer to Trinitarians and non Trinitarians, and that the majority of cases it's referring to Trinitarians. I showed you where the Quran tells the, the people of the book or the people of the Angel to follow what they have written with them of the Angel. Your response is the Quran says the Angel was given as a book to Isa. That can't be Matthew. Mark, Luke and John, therefore the Quran is correct. That's a circular argument and therefore we can remove that immediately. Then you point out about how all these heretical groups, you, ha you still haven't found a single one that aligns with Islam and you need it to align with what the Quran says because the Quran affirms it. So it has to align perfectly. Good luck finding that. It doesn't exist. So I think that's it. There was nothing really of substance here. I think you kind of demonstrated my point that you're unable to address these arguments. Hamza and John Fontaine, I'd love to have a live stream with you or to have a chat with you. If you're watching this, 
please get in touch. This is just one of the things I've been doing. There's many other things. There's many other arguments as well that I didn't have time to include in the presentation. I could go through those as well. I have a funny feeling. You won't though, because I don't think you have answers. And everyone that's watching this, if you could share with Hamza and John Fontaine or somehow get this to them, I would really appreciate it. It's important that we challenge these people to a debate so that the truth can be known to Christians and to Muslims. If you haven't already, come to Jesus Christ. If you have any questions about Christian belief or Christian practice, you can email me at chris at speakerscorner at gmail.com. And I hope you all, including John Fontaine and Hamza, have a great day. God bless.